All right, welcome to class four of Excel Core. My name is Don. This class is going to be all about charts. So you'll definitely want to download the data that um, from the website because you don't want to have to type all this stuff in. All right, charts are actually one of the ways that I got started in uh, spreadsheets. And that's because when I went to college, uh, the professor, uh, one of my professors had said, we no longer accept uh, handwritten graphs, um, put, um, sending them out, they all have to be computer generated. So we learned a bunch of different ways to do computer generated graphs way back when, and one of those was by uh, using a spreadsheet. So I'm going to show you a couple of different spread or different graphs that we use, and then um, what each one of them is used for. So I brought up the first tab of the download, which is going to be the timesheet one. This is what we did in class one. I have Fredrickson Jones Monroe and I have all their gross pays. And what I would like to do is I'd like to see um, what each person takes out as a percentage every week. So if I come here to insert, I can see all the different types of charts that I have approximately in the middle of my ribbon. The first one is a columnar chart or bar chart. This is good for showing magnitudes of information. So if you wanted to see how big something was compared to something else, you would use a columnar chart. There's also the trend chart or a line chart. This is going to show you trends, such as if the stock market is going up or if it's going down. So how history is doing compared to right now. We also have um, some statistical charts. So a, um, a histogram which would be a count of how many times a certain thing has come up um, within a certain range, that's going to be used there. And bubble charts, this is what happens when we don't have an independent variable. All we have is dependent variables, and we'd like to put those on both the X and Y axis. And we'll be playing around with those a little bit later too. But first, showing us how much of a percentage uh, each item gets, that's going to be a pie chart. So. I want to have a pie chart of Fredrickson Jones Monroe, and I also want to have all their gross pays. So I'm going to select from Fredrickson to Smith, and then when I select the gross pay, I'm going to hold down the control key, select 361, click and hold. So don't click on it once and then click again and hold. Click and hold and drag down to 450. So that should have Fredrickson through Smith selected and gray. 361 through 450 is selected, but 361 is white, meaning that's going to be the first one that we click then. I'm going to click on the pie chart, and it gives me multiple ways that I could look at the pie chart. A 2D, a 2D exploded, or even a 3D. Ever since they came out, I like the 3D exploded pie, or the 3D pie. Now, when I click on this chart, let me see if I can move this down a little bit. All right, that looks pretty good. Now, when I click on the chart, it gives me a tab that shows me what I can do with it. Uh, the first one is to add a chart element. If something isn't there that I want, I could put it in. I'm going to hold off on that one for just a little bit and instead go to Quick Layout. This is Microsoft's artistic folks saying, hey, this is how we would normally want to look at a chart whether it was with the percentages, with the people's names, or with uh, the series names, etc. So it's a nice, easy way for me to look at the charts and get me 90% of the way there before I have to do the work of the last 10%. So the, first, uh, the second one might be the chart title on top, the people going across in each one of the percentages. I could go to their names and what they actually made. I can go with the chart titles and who they are. I could do percentages, who they are in chart title, but I'll pick the first one, which is going to be the chart title, the name, and the percentage. Click on this, and now we have a, a chart. Looks pretty good. <clears throat> now I'm gonna think about how am I going to present this? What is my final, um, my final outcome for this chart? In this case, I'm going to have it as a uh, something on a report, something that is a piece of paper that is handed to people. So white is a good background to have. 
But if this is going to be something that is going to be presented like in a PowerPoint or in a Prezi, we could use the different chart styles that are up or above. So the next one over, if I just hover over it, it gives me kind of a translucent pie with the people's names as um, boxes over the top of the pies. I could do it with a slightly darker chart with a background or even uh, something that I like much better, which is something that just gave up. Let's go back here. Well, that didn't work out. Click off, click, and it did it again. Okay, let's see. I'm going to close down this. Don't save. Oh, crap. Okay, on second thought, let's bring that back up again, huh? Control J, session four. All right, so that was the one that I wanted to get rid of. All right, so select this, control, gross pay, all the way down, insert, 2D pi, 3D, there it is, click. My pie charts come out there. I'm going to use the first quick layout, the percentages. And what I was going to do is hover over the one with the black background. If I was doing a presentation, I usually try to stick with the darker backgrounds so that when this comes up, it doesn't blind my um, audience when they're in a dark room uh, looking at my uh, presentation. So, but in this case, again, I was going to keep it as a report. So something a little bit along this line right there. All right, now chart title, 100% accurate, but not very descriptive of what it is. So I'm gonna click on it once. When I do, I get a border around it, which says that I can now make changes to it. Click on it again, drag this out, and I'm going to say blood-sucking employees. All right, now, if I was Fredrickson, I'm going to try to uh, give this to the boss because I could see that I'm one fifth of the crew, but Smith is making nearly one quarter of the uh, pay that's leaving. So what I want to do is I want to ask the boss for a raise. So if I was Fredrickson, I want to show that Smith is getting paid a lot and it should stand out. The first thing that I can do is perhaps change the color. Now this is a nice colorful graph, but I could change the colors totally by coming up here to change colors click on that and I could use specific colors. So um, you could use um, the school colors. If you're IBM, you could use blue to, to white, but I'll keep with the colorful colors here. Second one is I could also change Smith's pie piece by itself. If I click on it once, I could see that Smith's pie piece is selected along with everyone else's because I get a dot around all the pie pieces. If I click on it again, and again, I'm clicking on the pie piece, not over the label name, I can see that this pie piece for Smith alone is now selected. I could right click over my selection, which would give me a context sensitive menu. And one of those things says fill. I can use the fill on the upper portion of my um, mini toolbar, is what they call it. Click on this, and I'll just make it red. Now, unfortunately, my boss might be red, blue, colorblind. And if that's the case, I, as Fredrickson and Smith, might look the same. So I want to push Smith out to kind of draw my eye to it. Again, click on Smith's pie piece. So I see all the pie pieces are selected. Click on it again, and then click and hold and drag away from the center. And when I do, Smith's pie piece is out. I'm trying to do, there we go. Smith's pie piece is out. So for some of us, you probably moved it out and then all of a sudden, Fredrickson jumps out of his pie piece. Why is this? Um, that's because in the millisecond that Excel had to figure out if everything is gonna fit, it looked at it and said, no, I don't think Fredrickson's gonna fit within the pie piece. I think the computer was wrong. So let's move Fredrickson back into the pie piece. I'll click on the label for Fredrickson once and when I do, I get uh, borders around all of my labels. And when I click on it again, now I have just Fredrickson selected, go over an edge, and when I do I get the black crossed arrow, which is a way for me to tell, yep, I can move stuff. Click, hold, and drag. And I'll drag that over Fredrickson's pie piece and look at that. Fredrickson is now in within the pie piece and I can see everything is the way that I want to present it to the boss. 
All right, so I presented to the boss and I said, hey, uh, I'm Fredrickson, I think I deserve a raise because look how much Smith makes. And the boss says, you're absolutely correct, Smith makes too much. So we're going to change Smith's pay rate. So now instead of getting paid $11.25 an hour, I'm going to click on that pay rate, $11.25, and change it to 10. When I hit enter, $10 an hour, it recalculates Smith's gross pay and all of a sudden, now everybody's got a, uh, a pay raise. Fredrickson now makes 20%, so congratulations. So Fredrickson, a pie piece, uh, 20%, and uh, I did that change by changing the numbers. What I was trying to explain with that is, first we're going to make it work and make it, we'll see it, and if we do need to change a, a number or two, we can do that coming back here to the pay rate and then when I do make the changes, it will automatically update the chart. All right, that's pretty good. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, put that into a report. So I'm gonna move a word over here and I'm gonna go and just get some gibberish text. If you've never um, needed to get uh, gibberish text before, there's gibberish text called lorem ipsum. And this has just uh, been used as a typesetting text for a couple hundred years. And it uh, starts off lorem ipsum, dolor sedamit, etc. And you could get some by going to lipsum.com. I went ahead and grabbed some, click on it, drag it down, copy, and I'm going to paste it here. Paste text. So now I have a bunch of gibberish text. The reason that I call it gibberish is because it is Latin in some respect, but it doesn't make any sense. And the reason that we would use it is that it has multiple, it is uh, uh, different sizes for each word. So if we use text, 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 it would come out to be uh, a certain pattern. And it has upper and lower case and things like that. Now I wanna take my chart and I wanna put it into this report. Come back here to Excel, click on this chart, and I'm going to hit Control C, as in Charlie. Then I go back here to my Word document, click approximately where I want to put it. So I want to put it somewhere in the second paragraph, and then I'm going to paste. So I'm going to paste it by coming up here to Paste, and instead of uh, saying, oh, I'm just going to paste it as a default object, I'm going to paste it as a picture. When I click on that, I can see, yep, I, I have my chart. This is looking pretty good, except that it's now um, split between the paragraph above and the paragraph below. I'd like the paragraph of text to move around my chart. To click on this chart then, and when I do, I'm going to get a rainbow. This is going to say, how do you want your text to run around the picture in this case? I'll click on this, and now I'm going to go with text wrapping tight. And now when I do, if I select and drag it around, let's try to zoom in a little bit further, there we go, I can again move this around and the text is going to wrap around my chart. Awesome. I could leave it like this or sometimes our, ch our, our data is changing while we're doing this. So I want to put it in there and I want to make sure that it looks pretty good, but I might not have the most accurate numbers quite yet. So I want to be able to update this when this happens. To do that, I'm going to erase what I have, come back here to my, I'm going to make this just a little bit bigger, come back here to my chart, copy it again, and now I'm going to paste it back in here. But I'm not going to paste it as a, as a chart object or as a picture. I'm going to paste it as a link. I'm going to come up here to paste and then paste special. I can do it as a chart object, a bitmap, or paste a link, which says I'm actually going to link back to this item. And if it changes, it should automatically update in my uh, report in this case. Click OK. I have my chart again. Click on it. I have my uh, rainbow. Click on that, and I'll make it tight. All right. And there we are. Now, back here. So Smith goes ahead, kicks the boss out, and decides to give him or herself a big raise at about 
So now Smith is making 29% of the pie. If all goes correctly, I should be able to go back to my Word document and see that it's automatically updated. Click on this and look at that. It automatically updates. So if you link it, that means that it will automatically update when the data changes for that link. Yes, this will also change if you close it down and if it's made a change. But when you go back here to this report, it's going to ask you if you'd like to update uh, the links. So if you don't, you'll have old data there. All right, beautiful. I would say any questions, so instead, coffee break. All right, so pies are good for showing percentages of what um, is going on. But I might want to use something else like a, a bar chart. This is good for showing magnitudes of information. Right now, I have the sales for Smith, Jones, Peterson, and Hansen, January, February, and March. Oh, sorry, I, I wanna go back one more. So I'm back here to the timesheet. One of the questions that's gonna come up on that quiz that comes out afterwards is it's going to say, um, best graph uh, uh, to show percentages of items, that's going to be a pie chart, P-I-E, so you don't have to put in any caps or anything like that, it's just P-I-E. All right, more data. All right, so I have all of this data and I wanna see it as magnitudes. So the boss says, hey, show me first quarter. Awesome. I'm going to select right now at A2 and then click and drag down. This is going to show me what I want as the x-axis, which is Smith, Jones, Peterson, and Hansen and also what I want as the series, January, February, and March. So I selected on some place where both of those uh, intersected, even though there was no text there. Click on that and drag down to the end of Hansen's March, the last series. Insert, bar chart, and I'm going to do the 3D columnar chart and click on this. Awesome. Looks like a good chart. Now, chart title, 100% accurate, not very descriptive. So I'm going to say sales by employee by month. All right. Now, how do I want it to be laid out? Do I want the legend down below? No, nah, that's, that's a little bit too, too old. I want to put the legend over there to the right quick layout, and I can see that the first one gives me the legend to the right-hand side. Beautiful. All right, so I'm thinking that this is a pretty good one. So I show it to the boss. The boss goes, hey, that's pretty cool. Put the second quarter on there, too. Okay, boss, uh, go away for about an hour. So the boss goes away, and uh, now what we're going to do is click on the chart, and when I do, I get a border around all of the the items that make up my chart, all of the data. I'm going to grab on to the blue border. I'm going to go to the bottom of the blue border where I get a black crossed arrow, which means that I can move it. And now I can click, hold, and drag to the right. And now when I let go, I can see that it gives me April, May, and June. So that took me about two minutes. So I can play around on the web for about 55 minutes before uh, the boss comes back in. I mean, if the boss isn't going to give you a raise, you get to use your time as you see fit. So the boss comes in and says, hey, wait a second. No, no, no. I didn't want just the second quarter. I wanted the first and second quarter together. I wanted it to be the first half on there. Okay, boss, go away for another hour. Boss goes away. Again, I'm going to click on this chart, go to the lower right -hand, left hand side in this case, over the blue border that makes up the data. But now, instead of dragging it, I'm going to make it larger by clicking on the corner, clicking and dragging, expanding the size of that uh, box. So now I can see that I'm getting sales by employee by month from January to June. All right. Again, I would ask if there's any questions. So instead, coffee break. All right, now I could have shown you all the stuff on using uh, three or six months, but three will be a lot easier to understand and see. So I'm going to shrink this back down to my original uh, first quarter earnings 
by sale or first quarter sales by employee by month. All right, this looks pretty good, but really it's not showing us the whole, the whole story. For example, I could see that it says 5,000 to 30,000 over on the left-hand side. Well, does that mean $5,000 or 5,000 items? I would want to put in a title to tell which ones we're looking at. Click on the chart, chart design, and now the far left-hand side says chart elements. What things am I looking for? Click on the drop-down. I want an axis title, and I want an axis title on the primary vertical edge, one over to the left-hand side. Click on it, and now I can say units sold. And click on that. Awesome. When you start doing these charts and pivot tables and things like that, the, peop uh, the people who you're going to give this to might say, okay, this is great. I'm looking at this, but what does it mean? And in this case, I want to show that Hansen's doing a good job and Peterson might not be doing such a good job. So I'm going to click on this chart, come back here to insert, and I want to insert a shape. Click on the drop down, and in the basic shapes, third row dead center is a smiley face. I'm going to click on it and then drag it over, no hands. And now if I click, hold, and drag, I'm going to go from one corner to the next corner. And as I do, I can see that I'm creating a face. Now, great, I have this face. But um, as I'm drawing this out, what I'd like to do is I'd like to make sure that it's not squashed. So it's not like this, uh, really squashed or thin. So to do that, as I drag something out, if I want it to maintain aspect ratio, I'm going to hold down the shift key as I do this. So now I'm going to get a smiley face that is not squished. Awesome. All right, so I have a smiley face on my chart. I want to put down a smiley face down here next to Peterson too. I could grab the insert and drag it out here, but that's way too much work. Instead, what I could do is I could click on this um, this uh, vectored art. That's all I can come up with, clip art, thank you. I'm gonna hold down the control key and notice that my cursor changes. It changes from just like the black crossed arrow to a little plus next to it. That means if I click, hold, and drag, I'm making a copy of the thing that I've selected. All right, now, as I'm looking at Peterson's smiley face, I see that there's a bunch of dots. I have four dots around the corners. That means that I can make it bigger or I can make it smaller. I have dots around the edges, which means that I can make it more squat or I can make it taller if I wish. I have a swirly up at the very top, which means that if I go over the top of it, I see a black swirly. And if I click, I can actually move it to uh, upside down or at a different angle but the last one that I wanted to show was that there is a yellow diamond or a yellow circle on this one. And that will fundamentally change my clip art. So if I click on this yellow dot and drag it up towards the nose, I can see that actually it's changed the smile to a frown. So if we ever bring in vectored art and we say, oh, um, we see yellow diamond or a yellow dot or a yellow diamond to it, that means that we can move that yellow diamond and it's going to change the way that this looks. All right, smiley face for Hansen, frowny face for Peterson. You might want to say, why does Peterson have a frowny face? Well, insert, shapes, and I'm going to go to the A with the box around it. That's going to be a text box, and I'm going to click on it. Now I could click down and start typing, but what happens is as I type more and more, it's going to keep going to the right. I want it to wrap around in the box. So for me to do that, I'm going to click on one corner and drag down to the opposite corner. I'll say, he's drunk a lot. All right. I have my data, or I have my, my text, but it's too big for the box. Even if I make the box a little bit bigger, it's still too big. So instead, I'm going to select the text, come up here to home, and instead of 11, I'll make this one say eight. He's drunk a lot. Perfect. 
All right. So this kind of explains what's going on with a columnar chart, and I have a um, uh, some kind of uh, explanation as to why Peterson uh, Peterson's numbers are so low. We might also want to change what each one of these columns are. So I see that I have a blue, a red, but this gray column, it's kind of boring. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on it once, and then if I right click, it gives me a context sensitive menu. And what I'll do is I will say format data series. When I do, it says, okay, would you like to have it as boxes or pyramids? Do you want to change uh, the shadow or the glow? Or the paint can, which is the fill and border. In the fill, rather than having it as an automatic fill, I want to put in a picture. It puts in linen to begin with, but instead what I want to do is I want to put in a, uh, a decent picture. I'm going to click on that from Files, and let's see. I'm going to move over here. I'm going to go to my pictures, and I'll put in a picture of me. So little Dilbert there with the coffee cup, but I can see that they're all stretched. So instead of being stretched, I want it to be stacked. Now I can see that they're stacked and I want to stack and scale. I want it to stack for every 5,000 units, I'm going to get one picture. So I can see that, yep, this is approximately three Dilberts tall and Hansen is approximately six Dilberts tall. All right, beautiful. Would say any questions, but coffee break. All right, so this is going to be another one of those questions that are going to come up, which is going to say uh, the best graph to show magnitude, which is what we're doing here, and that one is going to be a bar chart. So just type in bar. Awesome. Now I have stocks. Um, this is very common where I'm going to have a lot more data than actually I need. So I, what I did was I went to finance.yahoo.com and I grabbed the closings for Apple, Microsoft, and the Dow uh, by week for over 15 years. So lots of data in here. What I'd like to do is I'd like to give a trend on how these things are doing um, during that time period based upon how they closed. So the first thing is I don't necessarily need open, high, low, close, and volume. I'm always afraid to delete what I have because as soon as I do, next day they're gonna say, well, we wanted it by open, and then I have to go through all the work again. So instead, I'm gonna hide it. I'm going to click on B, drag to F, right click, and then come here to hide, which will hide the data coming from A to F or A to G. Now, it also says Apple and adjusted close. I want Apple to be right on the uh, adjusted close. I don't need to see it again. I could type right over the top of it. I can copy it there. Or if I click on this, go to an edge, drag over it, it's going to ask, hey, you're moving something that already has something there. Do you want to replace it? In this case, yes, I do. So in case you start moving around and it says, hey, do you want to do this? If you weren't sure what was going on, you could hit cancel or no and find out Am I supposed to do this? Is this the right thing that I wanted to do? All right, now I wanna take data and Apple and then uh, grab all of the information. And in fact, all the information comes down here to 784 uh, rows of information. But from what I showed you in one of the last classes, we don't have to drag it down. I could hold down shift, arrow over once, hold down control, arrow down again, and now I have all of my information selected. Insert, trend, and I'll just do a simple 2D line chart. And there we are. Here's the Apple stock prices closing at the ends of the week for the last 15 years, ending with um, 2015. All right, great. I wanna get Microsoft in there too. I wanna see how Apple uh, went to Microsoft. So clicking on the chart, I can see the different quick layouts that I can do. I can see the different styles, but in here I have select data. I could add in additional data. When I click on this, it says, here's Apple and the stuff, and would you like to add another one? Yeah, but before I do that, what I wanna do is I wanna make sure that everything's formatted correctly. Cancel, all right, crap. 
wait a second, my chart's all the way down at the bottom. I might want to put it right here. So there's a few things that I can do. I'm going to go down to the bottom here. I'm going to cut this, which is control X as an X-ray, and then come back up here to the top. That's control home. And now if I paste, I can see that I have my Apple chart here. Something else that you might want to do is you might want to have it in its own tab so it doesn't get lost somewhere in your chart, uh, in your workbook. Right click over the top of it, and if I move to chart, I can now put it as a new sheet called chart one. So let's do that. So new sheet, instead of chart one, I'm going to call it uh, stocks chart. Boom, that disappears. I now have a new tab that says stocks chart. Awesome. Let's put Microsoft in there again. Stocks. I'm going to hide everything from H to O. Hide. Grab the Microsoft. And drag it down. Put it there. And now, stocks chart. Click on this. Click in here. Chart design. Select data. I want to add. And when I do, it says, okay, what's the series name? It has that uh, little tree-like thing. So it says, just click on what you're looking for. In this case, it'll be stocks, Microsoft. And when I tab off of it, I can see that it says, is equal to Microsoft. What Excel is doing right now is it gives us one data point. It says, yep, you're, you're, I'm gonna give you one. This always messes it up because if I start dragging down with the rest of the, the um, stock prices, it's going to add to it. So I'm going to actually remove those four characters, click on the 4645, control, shift, down. It now puts in the gibberish that's necessary for me to get that range. And I want to click OK. Voila. I could see that the blue will be Microsoft. The green is Apple. All right, this looks pretty good uh, for Microsoft versus Apple computer companies. But how did they do versus the, um, the stock market in general versus the Dow? I'm going to go back here to stocks. I'll say OK to this. Come back here to the stocks. Come up to the top. Control Home gets me back to A1. And select from Q to X. Right click, hide. Dow Jones, drag down. All right. Stocks, chart design, select data. I'm going to add a new legend, a new series. First part of the series, I want to get the name. Come back here, stocks, Dow Jones. Tab off of it, DJIA. Series values, remove the four characters that are there. Come back here to this first one, control, shift, down. Brings it all the way down, and now when I click OK, voila. Some of you are right now going, wait a second, I screwed up. I don't see Apple or Microsoft in there anymore. Well, this is because the Dow is actually three or four orders of magnitude larger than the stock prices. Um, at the very beginning, Apple stock price was $3, close to uh, the beginning of the turn of the millennium. But you know, we're looking at 12,000. So it's just grossly um, outmatched by the Dow. The Dow grossly outmatches um, both stock prices. So what can we do about that? What I'm going to do is I'm going to um, change around the chart a little bit. I'm going to click on that, the chart for, or the line for the Dow, right click, giving me a context sensitive menu, and I'm going to go down here to format data series. When I do, the first thing that it pops up is it says, where would you like to put this data? On the primary axis, which is to the left-hand side, or the secondary axis, here. Ah, if I put it on the secondary axis, what happens is I now have two different types of, two vastly different orders of magnitude numbers, but I'm still able to tell the trends that were going along during this time period. So for example, Microsoft seems to be doing a pretty steady job of it all at around 40. Apple has a meteoric rise up there and the Dow, although it took taking kind of a hit near 2008, it was climbing up steadily after that. 
So Apple is outpacing the Dow for the most part since the crash, and Microsoft just toodles along. All right, so that's primary axis, that's secondary axis, and the things that are in here, again, we could put in uh, text boxes or other lines to annotate what we're looking at, along with the uh, titles, etc. That, again, brings us to another question that might come up at the end. The question is going to be, um, what graph shows the best graph to show trends? And that's going to be a four, uh, four letter, yep, four letter, all lowercase, line chart, which is what we just did right here. All right, beautiful. Right. So next one, scatter plots. All right. As I said, scatter plots are going to be where we have dependent data. We just have numbers and then the ice cream sales. So there's not really anything that we could do an x axis of. It would look weird. So instead, what I want to do is I want to just find plot these, plot these uh, values. Say like the temperature on the x axis versus the ice cream sales on the y axis. We have a problem here. We have a uh, degree symbol for all the temperature. This is going to freak out Excel because it doesn't understand it. So what I'm going to do is to go to one of my values, come up here to the formula bar, and select the um, percent, or excuse me, the degree symbol, which I did by holding down shift and just arrow over once. Control C as in Charlie come here to my, anywhere within my um, workbook, worksheet, control H. Control H uh, is again one of those commands that works through most things in Windows, and that's the find and replace. What I wanted to do is find that degree symbol, since it's on my clipboard now, control V as in Victor, and then I want to replace it with nothing. Replace all, 13 replacements, looks pretty good. All right, beautiful. Now, I'm going to come here to temperature, all the way down here to 408. Insert, scatter, and I'll do a nice 2D scatter plot. All right, and it has the ice cream sales there. Beautiful, let's move like this, and then this, and get rid of this. All right. So I have ice cream sales versus um, the temperature on the x-axis. Now I'm looking at that and I can kind of see that there's a trend. It seems like the hotter it gets, the more ice cream sales. Perfect. I want to know what the actual mathematical formula is behind that. So if I look at the um, weather for the tomorrow and I see that it's going to be hotter, I know that I could call in additional employees and I can guess how busy it's going to be based off of some formula. All right, I'm going to click on that series and then I'm going to right click over the top of it and one of them at the bottom says add trend line. Click on that, it brings out, there we go, a new panel on the right hand side and it first says what kind of trend line are we looking at? This is where experience comes into play. I could say, oh, it's an exponential but does that mean that it's, I'm going to keep selling more and more um, ice cream, even when it becomes literally boiling hot, 100 degrees centigrade? Is it going to be linear? Meaning as it gets hotter, am I just going to get it more and more as a linear function? Logarithmic, does it actually fall off? Is there a maximum sale, sales? I could do polynomial or powers. In this case, I'm going to pick it as linear. All right, I can also see, let's move that over, that um, right now it goes from about 12, what was it, 11 and a half, 11.9 to 25. I could also forecast it forwards by however many periods. I want to forecast it by two. And then I also want to forecast it backwards. I'll do that by another two also. So I have this line and now I can guess how bad it's going to be at uh, 10 degrees centigrade or 27 degrees centigrade. All right. I could set the intercept if I wish, or what I'll do is I'll display the equation on the chart. This is the mathematical formula that I can use to figure out how much I'm gonna make based upon the temperature. 
I also want to know how good it is. How valid is this uh, equation based upon the um, empirical data? And that's our r squared value. r squared, if it was perfect, would be an r squared of 1. In this case, I get a, a 0.91. Not bad when it comes to temperature and ice cream. Um, usually for uh, scientific purposes, we're looking at a 95% and people are trying to pump that up to 99% because we have so much more data available to us nowadays. All right, let's see how this looks. Y is equal to 30 blah 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 times the temperature minus this. So I'm going to say that the temperature is, is going to be 27 degrees centigrade. So what are the sales? Sales are going to be equal to, because that's going to start a function or a formula, it always starts equals, and it's going to be 30.088 times temperature minus 159.47. So at 27 degrees centigrade, I should make approximately $652. So right here, that looks about right. I can also look for this one expressly. I think this one is about uh, 400 right there. It's 18.5. Come back here. 18.5. 397. Very close to empirical data. All right. Um, any questions or coffee break? All right, <clears throat> bubble chart. Sometimes we have uh, our data in three dimensions. In this case, we have number of products, we have the sales, and then we have the market share. I'd like to see all three of those items on a chart. And a bubble would work well for this. I'll click on the first one, 14 products, and drag it down here to 42%. Insert. And I'll do the charts, and that was the scatter plot. But then at the bottom it says bubble, and I could do a 2D bubble or a 3D bubble. I'll do the 3D, make it look nice. All right. So we'll move this over here. All right. So there is the uh, sales on the primary axis. On the x axis, we're going to say that the number of products. And the size of each bubble is going to give me the market share. If this didn't come out right, if this wasn't what we were expecting, what we could do is we could switch the column in the row. So when I click on this, this would give me a different look to this chart. I have no clue of what that would be. But if it depends, if you said, well, it didn't quite turn out the way that I want, you click on switch row and column, and that will um, flip the series going into an x-axis or an x-axis going into the series. So again, for more ex for another example, that would be Smith, Jones, Peterson, and Hansen on the more data. What I can do is January, February, and March are my series, but if I want Smith, Jones, Peterson, and Hansen to be my series, I could switch row and column, and it looks better. It looks like what I would want it to be. Click again, back to where it was. All right, so that was the bubble chart. All right, spark lines. I have one down here. Um, interestingly enough, I don't have the same one for my handout, but that's fine enough. I'm gonna come back here to more data. <clears throat> I can see Smith's uh, data going from 18,000, 9,000, et cetera, all the way down here. Maybe I wanna know how Smith's um, uh, line chart would look in this case. And I want to put that little line chart in N. Click in for Smith's N, so N3, insert, and I have a sparkline thing. This gives me a really small chart within one cell. So I'm going to do a line chart, which is good for showing trends, and ask two things. First one is the data range. I'll pick that from B3 to M3. And then where would you like it to be placed? In this case, N3. Click, and I have a little spark line that shows that Smith is constantly going up in sales. 
I can click, hold, drag this down, and now I can see that there are different spark lines for Jones, Peterson, and Hanson. And again, as those numbers change, so Smith squirreled up all of the sales from the previous year and it got 78,000. Now I can see that that spark line changed and that graph changed too, the chart. All right, so that is a spark line. All right, Pareto graph. You may have heard of the 80-20 uh, the principle. Um, for business, for, uh, for my business, I should say, um, I get about 80% of my work from 20% of my people. So in this case, it's the 80-20 rule, which says that 80% of something comes from 20% of something else. This or, uh, is the complaints for a, uh, for a hospital here in Duluth for a particular month. And I'm gonna guess that it also follows the 80-20 rule, that 80% of our complaints can be generated from 20% of the items that we kind of take a survey on. So how would I find that? This um, chart, the best chart for this, would be a Pareto chart. And uh, to do this, first off, what I'm going to do is sort the complaints by the quantity. And then sort it from the largest to smallest. Click here, home, sort and filter, and I'm going to sort largest to smallest. Click, boom, comes up pretty fast. Now at the bottom, I want to get the grand total. So under home, auto sum, click on that. Now I get a sum from C5 to C17, and that gives me 557. Like I showed you in the previous uh, video with um, functions, I believe, we can name those uh, ranges. So I'm going to name that uh, cell location total complaint. Total complaint. It's awesome. Now I want the cumulative percent. All right. Now the first one's going to be pretty easy. It's going to be whatever that is divided by total, and as you do, total complaints. Awesome. Now I'm going to copy this guy down. Now that's 19% for the 108, but I really don't want that 19%. I want the 19% plus the 28 above. So I'm going to add to it plus, uh -oh, do this again, come back here, plus whatever is in D5. 47%, 47 click, brings it down. You know, percentages are all always less than one unless I put in a percent sign right there. That looks pretty good. And I'll make a few more decimal points to it by coming here to the number. And I see that there's an arrow pointing out uh, a small number on top, two zeros on the bottom. Increase the decimal by two. All right, now I wanna make this into a chart. Complaints, cumulative percent, drag it down here to 100. Insert. Now there's nothing here that says a Pareto chart, but I'm going to make it starting off with a columnar chart. So a simple 2D columnar chart. When I do, I can see the quantities are going down like they should, but cumulative percent is again, multiple orders of magnitude smaller than it should be. So I wanna, I wanna put that on the secondary axis right there. I could try to grab it, I can move it, or I'm going to click on the uh, legend once, it selects everything, click on it again, and now I've, I've done the cumulative percent, and if I then right click over the top of it, I could format the data series, and I'll put that on the secondary axis. So if you can't grab it, you can grab it and manipulate it by um, actually selecting on part of the legend. Now, it's put both of these as columnar charts and they're one on top of each other. So I can't see actually the quantities that were there. So I wanna change the type of chart for my cumulative percent from a columnar chart to a line. That just means that I can change the chart type. This would have been another way that I could have changed the axis. I could have clicked here and gone to the secondary axis, but my cumulative percent, instead of being a clustered column, what I'd like to do is I'd like to make that into a line. 
Awesome. So I can see that my uh, the amount of the percentages are going up as um, the quantity gets to be smaller and smaller. All right. Now you might be trying to convince your parents that you're working at 120% here at college right now, but uh, we know differently you can only give 100%. So it looks really bad to have 120% up there because how could you do 120%? So I'm gonna click on that once as my access, right click giving me a context sensitive menu, and then I'm going to format the axis. What's the minimum? What's the maximum? Maximum of 1.2? Nope, I want it to be one. Now I can see, yep, 98, uh, 190, 80, 70, 60. Um, if I make it a little bit taller, it will make it a little bit easier to, to read. All right, let's uh, come back to our final thing, which was 80% of my work comes from about 20% of the things. So working on a small number of items could mean that I get a huge payoff at the end. I'm going to insert a shape, a line. I'll click on the 80% here and start dragging. Well, you can see that I've probably drank two or three cups of coffee today. So instead of dragging out and trying to make a horizontal line while my hands are shaking, Instead, I'm gonna hold down the, the shift, which will make it a horizontal line. And I'll do one more, going down. Boom. Now I can see that if I worked on approximately these four items, hospital cafeteria food, waiting room overcrowded, walk-up clinic not open on Saturday, and no parking available, that I would get rid of nearly 80% of all the complaints that I have. All right, beautiful. All right, last one. Um, nowadays, we might want to be able to take our data and put it on a map instead. So instead of just doing simply a columnar chart or a line chart, I want to put it on a map and see how well this works. You might uh, get something online called ArcGIS. There's a couple of free ones that you can download, or you could actually use something that's built into Excel. Um, under Insert, we have a 3D map right here. Before I use that, I wanna go ahead and I wanna give a little bit more information to the, each one of these counties. So I have Aiken County, Carleton County, Cook County. Now, <clears throat> let's look at Lake County. Lake County, Minnesota, that's where I want it to be talking about. But there's actually another Lake County that's much more populated in Indiana. And if I just gave the computer Lake County, it would assume that you're talking about Lake County. Indiana. If I was talking about St. Louis County, it would say St. Louis, Missouri, as opposed to St. Louis, Minnesota. So I want to actually add a little bit more information, the comma MN. So I'll put in comma MN, copy that, here, paste, 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 paste paste, and paste. Awesome. All right, we have their counties. We have the, the um, number of people who are in there by year. I'm going to select from county and drag it down to the last number of people. 3D map, I want to open 3D maps. After a little bit of crunching, it's going to go ahead and start up another type of program, which came over here. In. It says, oh, these are the counties that you're probably thinking of. So, yep, the location came in as county, and now it says, what would you like to show as the height or the category? I'll zoom in a little bit. So, how do we want to see this? I could see it as a columnar chart, like this. I could see it as a bubble chart. Or I could also see it as a, a heat map, red meaning more meaning it's hotter. Or then again, I could also have it as different um, locations. And I like this one because it's going to show me each one of the uh, counties in there. But it says, okay, what actually makes a county look different? What's the field? In this case, I'm going to say 2008 data. 
and voila, when I do that, I can see that um, each one of these counties will have a different color based upon how much, how many people were there. And so we could see that uh, St. Louis County kind of dwarfs everything else that's in here. Well, let's see if we can make a difference. Let's see if we could change that based upon the 2012 in, uh, information. So instead of just having this, I'm gonna put in a new layer. So I'm gonna add a layer, and now it says, yep, there it is, we, we put in a second layer. Uh, actually, let me get back to that. Get rid of that. Delete. All right, I wanna add in a new um, scene. This is actually uh, set up so that you can do movies of how things change. So I'm going to add in a new scene, which is up here, new scene. And I'll copy the scene. So there's my scene two. Now instead of showing the 2008 stuff in scene two, I want to go ahead and show, close this, add a field, and I want to do the 2013. All right. So that's how it's going to look in 2013. How is this going to play out as a um, scene? I can click on play tour. You won't be able to see all of it because it's going to take my entire screen up. But um, as it goes along, it's going to continue to play. And it'll do this for about 10 seconds and then it'll change. I was waiting for, there it goes. And then it'll change to uh, the next one, which says, okay, this is 2013. And we could also make changes to this. So in like in, on this scene, we're going to put in a piece of text. So a text box that says something to the tune of 2008 pop. It's right there. And then click on that. And I can say that this one is going to be